everybody. Good morning. <laughs> I'm really excited to jump into today's episode. I'm Lydia, for those of you who may be new here or haven't quite gotten an introduction to me. You can find that in our second episode, I Answer the Prowse Questionnaire. I'm not big on introductions because I don't know how to introduce myself. We're extremely complex beings. I don't know how to sum myself up in, in a few words or so. But as most of you know me by, I am the founder of ReSelf, a digital platform and space for intersectional personal growth and holistic well-being. We are currently in beta, as those of you who have been listening to the podcast know. And, and this podcast is an extension of, of what we're doing over there at ReSelf. So I asked on our Instagram, which you can find the link in the show notes, what people want to talk about in our next podcast. And the resounding answer was morning and evening rituals. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about morning routine um, rituals. I say rituals instead of routine for a reason, and we'll dive into that in this episode. But we're basically going to, you know, run through the ringer on this. We're focusing on morning rituals today and creating a morning ritual. We're talking about why the morning, what's so special about the morning, what's so important about the morning, why a ritual or routine, why I use the word ritual instead of routine, what to do and how to do it. Let's dive right in. Why the morning? There's a quote from a book I will reference a few times in this episode that I think sums this up. The book is Good Mornings by Linnea Dune. There will be a link to it in the show notes. Essentially, the morning is the seed that blossoms into what becomes your day. What we do in the morning impacts our day so much, and oftentimes we don't even think about it. We have a morning routine, whether we call it a routine or whether it's just what we happen to do in the morning. Because out of habit, which is just the repetition of an action over time, we create that routine. And so in that same sense, we can consciously create that routine. In consciously creating a routine, we can set the tone for our day to be exactly what we want it to be. And that's really powerful. We can set our mind and our mood, even if we wake up in a funk. We can ground ourselves, our mind, our body, and our soul, and connect to and create wholeness within ourselves. In many ways, COVID has impacted all of our routines. In many ways, COVID has shown us where we need to spend more time nurturing our well-being and grounding in that foundation. COVID has also, I think, showed a lot of us how fast paced life has become. Life as we were doing it was. And I hear a lot now as we come around to a year of being in COVID, and as the demands of productivity begin to pick up, we're feeling a pressure to return to how fast paced our lives were before COVID. There's so much power in that awareness because we can decide, we can choose to embrace slowness to keep slowness with us, even if it was enforced on us by COVID, by lockdown. We can channel slowness 
and slowing down because of the benefits we noticed in our lives. And we can view it as not a luxury, but a way of consciously living and being present for each little moment of our lives. And I think that's really exciting. I find so much joy in my morning ritual. And I also notice so much, I, I can tell it's almost night and day when I have rushed through my morning, when I haven't done the things that I, you know, routinely do, I'm off, I'm anxious, I'm irritable, I'm not myself, and I'm certainly not who I want to show up as, and I can hardly be that for myself, let alone be that for other people. And it's not to be dramatic, but it's just to emphasize that when we notice how we're showing up, and then when we choose to do things differently, and then we notice how we show up because of those conscious decisions, that's really empowering. And it's also really, it makes you want to keep doing it. It's really motivating. It's self-motivating. And I want to say for the night owls, I've been a night owl. And still, sometimes I have rushes of creativity and inspiration at night, which I'll go with because it's, it's about honoring the present moment. Over the years, I've learned how to honor those rushes and how to create them at different parts of my day. So instead of subscribing to the belief that perhaps I could only create at night, I can create during the day. I can make space for that in my weekend when I'm not working. Or I can make space for that after work if I feel inspired and called to. Or I am going to set the bar in motion knowing that once I get going, I'll feel good and inspired and it'll all come back to me. I've just, I found it to be so much more freeing to suspend that self-identification as a night owl or not as a morning person, etc. Because it can, it can be true and it certainly is. By suspending that identification, we give ourselves space to be whatever we will be, to show up however we may show up, and we are able to challenge ourselves. We're not fighting who we believe we are, even if at this moment we go to bed late and because of that habit are on that cycle of time with our circadian rhythm. But I think it's really, well, the other thing for me, for sure, 100%, especially in college and especially in high school, was how am I spending this time? If I'm staying up until 1, 2, 3 in the morning watching Netflix, is this really worth my time? Or could I be doing something else? I think it's way more about the habit, right? Maybe one night or two nights I want to watch Netflix. Maybe one night I want to watch Netflix till 2 in the morning. Totally fine, but it's it's when we get into that routine or habit of every night I get in bed with my phone or my computer, I'm scrolling for hours or I'm just watching and watching and watching. What would happen if I went to bed and I journaled? I'd probably get pretty tired pretty quick and I'd go to bed and I wouldn't have that much of a hard time falling asleep or the same thing with reading or whatever it might be for you. Do you see do you know what I mean? Which then I guess brings us to why routine or why why create why consciously creating a routine routine is medicine and consistency is medicine and this is coming from someone that loves to be spontaneous and you know i used to think that discipline was the opposite of freedom see the book discipline equals freedom by Jocko Williams in the show notes. 
or if you prefer rhythm over routine, or feel like I used to about routines and discipline, this is still for you. I was thinking about this, and one of the first things I had to do in my eating disorder recovery, I had an eating disorder and I went through recovery, was to be very disciplined and routine about my food, about planning, preparing, making sure I got all my nutrients, checking in with myself, even, you know, really making sure to eat at specific times because with that, my eating had become so disordered. I had gotten so in my head and out of my body when it came to eating that I couldn't even come close to what is often referred to as intuitive eating or just eating when I'm hungry and being able to discern what I might need to eat to nurture my body. And I couldn't come close to that without the essential step of discipline. And it's the same thing here because that discipline is what helps us create a foundation. It's what helps us get out of our heads, get out of whatever that disorder is, and return to being able to intuitively know this morning I need yoga. This morning I need more time of meditation. This morning, you, you know, before we can find that rhythm, in order to be spontaneous and free, we most likely need the medicine of routine and discipline. And again, As someone who likes to be spontaneous, as someone who is free-spirited, as someone who is those things, I also need structure. I thrive on that structure, in a sense, because it's a relief. It's medicine, and it is freedom, because I'm no longer at the will of unconscious habits or unconscious patterns or the disorder. I've created discipline and structure, which can be enjoyable. And as I continue with consistency, I get to the place where I can honor what I need each morning, each moment. But it's that essential step of the routine and the discipline that I wanted to highlight. I prefer calling it a ritual, as Linnea refers to them as well in her book. Rituals create, they create a sacred space. Rituals are intentional. Rituals have meaning. Rituals consist of small bits that can be built up and on incrementally. They're sustainable, and they're rooted in our values. They're very personal, as opposed to a routine which might feel prescriptive and unmeaningful to us, which then we are more likely to fall off of. You know, understanding it as a ritual gives so much more space and compassion, like I said, meaning, it's less of an obligation, and again, it's, it's not an obligation, more so just a simple nurturing of the self, which is, as I often say, and I wonder, I probably say it in each episode, we're not taught this, unless you were taught this, which, you know, few and far between are, we weren't taught the importance of setting up our day, we weren't taught the importance of nurturing ourselves and how to nurture ourselves. But there's no time like the present. Here we go. We're beginning. We're learning. We're doing. That's what matters. We're trying. We don't have to be perfect. There is no perfect. And there's no space for perfectionism when we have self-compassion. 
So, some ideas on what to do in your morning ritual. I've said this in one of our previous episodes, but I'll emphasize it again. My morning ritual is a no phone zone. I don't sleep with my phone in my bedroom. If I need an alarm, I use my alarm clock. I've set myself up, and this is from trial and error, and figuring out where are my blocks and what are things that are going to make me slip up, and I have done away with them. And that's just through trial and error, and you'll figure out your own path and way with that. No phone, because really, like I said, the morning is time to check in with ourselves. It goes for our phone as well as when we're cohabitating with people. By giving ourselves that time and space to reconnect with ourselves after sleep, to set our intentions for the day, to align again, we're just setting everything in motion. Because if we check in with our phone or check in with other people before we check in with ourselves, we've skipped that essential step. And so then we're at the mercy of whatever is on our phone, whatever's, you know, whatever someone we're living with, you know, whatever's going on with them. And it can be harder to show up in those spaces on our phone or with others in the ways that we want to and hope to and ways that are also not harmful to ourselves and respect our boundaries and our needs. So some ideas. As soon as I wake up, I express gratitude. And this is something that after just doing it a few times when you wake up, it'll kind of become second nature. I say thank you for getting another day to live, something we often might take for granted. I mean these things, and it might sound like weird or cheesy, especially if you haven't done anything like this, but slowly we can come into the fact that it might sound weird, okay, cool, I'm alive, awesome, to really meaning it, wow, I'm so grateful to have woken up today. I honor the fact that I might not have gotten that and there are some people that didn't get that and so I already acknowledge I have so much to be grateful for. I tell myself today's going to be a great day and if the sun is shining I say thanks and express gratitude for that. If it's cloudy, if it's rainy, if it's snowy I express gratitude for that and I acknowledge something in that that I can be grateful for. And those are especially ones that I think a lot of people can relate to with me that, you know, I personally love the sun and I thrive with the sunshine. And so I struggle in the winter. And if it's been cloudy for many, many days or rainy for many, many days and I haven't seen the sun, that can affect my mood, seasonal depressive disorder. So yeah, it's it's really finding those little things that we can be grateful for each morning when we wake up and we're already aligning to acknowledging that there's so much in our lives that we can be grateful for and we can even be grateful for the things that we used to resist. Then I read a passage in Your True Home by Thich Nhat Hanh. These are little paragraph snippets from a Buddhist monk and they really just align me to first I I learn something I have a little chunk of wisdom to take with me into the day and it's just perspective that I value and I want to align to and I hold true in my heart and by reading it each morning I am setting myself up with that framework to move into the day, whatever it may be. This can look different for a lot of different people. When I first started this practice, I was in high school and I had these little tiny, tiny books of just quotes on different subjects and I would just open it and read the next quote in the book. 
And that was my little thing that I took with me into the day. It can look like whatever it might be for you. I really like aligning with something outside of myself, if that makes sense, because I'm going to talk about affirmations in a second, and those are all very personal, and I've written them, or I've chosen them. Different perspectives, man. Amazing. Next, meditation. I personally will either do a chakra meditation, a sitting meditation, you can do a walking meditation or a mantra meditation, anything like that I love because it anchors us in stillness. And especially in the morning when we could wake up and think, I've got to check my email, I've got to see what's going on, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Already the cogs are moving before your feet have even hit the floor. To anchor in that stillness really helps move through the day with, again, that, that alignment to stillness and that mindset of being present and taking things one moment at a time and email can wait. This can wait. That can wait. I'll get to it when I get to it. On top of the many other reasons one would meditate and the many benefits of that. If you're new to meditation or you use meditation apps, there's nothing wrong with that. Bringing awareness to if I'm using a meditation app or I'm using an online meditation, is that going to automatically, you know, on my phone or computer, is that going to automatically trigger something in me to check my text messages, to check, you know, social media, to check my email? Is that going to set me up to be pulled out of the moment? There are tons of meditations that we can learn and do and self-facilitate. You know, simply just focusing on our in-breath and our out-breath. You can say, breathing in, I breathe in the energy of love compassion and stillness or anything you're trying to call in and breathing out I release hatred I release resistance I release feeling the need to move quickly whatever that looks like for you you can focus on just your out breath which helps us to release and helps us to focus and to calm and still while giving space because we're allowing our in-breath to be whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be so complicated. It can be very simple as counting your breaths. It can be very simple as, like I said, those last two things. And when you catch yourself thinking, just remind yourself in your head or out loud, thinking, this is thinking, I'm thinking, and then just return to what you're doing because it helps us distance ourselves with our thoughts, which, you know, as the day picks up and things get hectic, our thoughts often do the same. So by setting ourselves in into that headspace in the morning, it's really helpful to translate and carry it into our day. Next, I say my affirmations. I've written these all down. I use a mala necklace to say each affirmation, say each mantra. If you want more information on affirmations, I'll link our episode below about tools to come back to yourself because I go into detail about how to use affirmations there. Essentially, these are all statements that I want to affirm and align to what I hold in my heart to be true, what I might be calling in or practicing, focusing on that I'm aware that I'm struggling with in this season of my life. Because again, we can get so easily swept up in what happens in the day. And I find that when I set my affirmations, I'm just so much more grounded and so much more rooted in myself and my values. And I can just move through the day how I want to move through the day as opposed to reacting. I can respond 
instead of being reactive. And that is a power in and of itself. Whatever it may be, you probably will find that your morning ritual can help you in that response rather than reaction. And I've done all of this in my bedroom alone, connecting to my own energy. Then I will, I have a dog, so I'll let him out, walk him, whatever. I'll make myself a glass of warm lemon water. This improves digestion, balances pH, is cleansing, really just a way to, again, another grounding practice. But again, as I slowly move into the things that I am going to do, like make breakfast, get started with work, walk the dog, interact with people, I'm slowly easing into that. And I just stand with my warm lemon water. I look outside. When it's warm enough, I stand outside. And I just breathe and look and listen and take in the moments as I drink my warm lemon water. Then I will make some juice. I love celery, apple, and kale. This has tons of diverse vitamins and minerals, and is my substitute for espresso or green tea or matcha. Like a lot of people, every morning I would wake up and have my espresso, and I drink a lot of espresso. And I, you know, over the years have noticed when I stop drinking coffee and when I get over that hunch of the misery of not having any caffeine, I can notice how I feel better and I can also notice how much more anxious I am on caffeine. And it's, I I love espresso. I love green tea. I love matcha. And I especially love putting matcha in my celery, apple, and kale juice. But It's really, it's just an example. I wanted to share this because it's an example of we can know something might be quote unquote bad for us, but it doesn't mean we need to stop doing it 100%. Do you know what I mean? There's a balance in it. And this is, I think, a great example of replacing habits. I used to drink coffee. I used to make myself coffee every morning. Now I make myself juice every morning. So it's that substitute and a substitute that pays off way more. And it also honestly really helps me enjoy when I have espresso, how good it is, how good those flavors are and not just need it because it's an addiction, because caffeine is literal addiction and drug. I think it's a great example, too, of something that is socially acceptable, but also we don't talk about necessarily its negative impacts. And I'm not trying to convince you to stop drinking coffee, but I think it's just a great example of deciding for yourself what you want and being able to make that decision over something and replacing it. And then I do some form of movement. Recently, for me, it's been yoga. This season, winter, I need something a little more grounding and a little more concentrated, a little bit more of that mind, body, soul, wholeness connection versus a workout or a run. And it looks different every day. It could be a sun salutation. It could be a very slow yin flow. It could be vinyasa. It really depends on what I'm feeling and what I need. And obviously, time. What, however this might look for you, it could be as simple as dancing through your morning, dancing through making your breakfast to your favorite music. It just helps us connect in our bodies 
and ground in our bodies and obviously honor our body's need for movement and the benefits of movement for all of our aspects of self. That brings me to breakfast and it looks different every day. I might start doing some work before I make my breakfast. Whatever I need, I give myself that space to eat when I'm ready. I make it an enjoyable experience. I make it a 30-minute time that I'm going to listen to music, I'm going to cook, I'm going to prepare something nutritious, and just enjoy the process. Some of you might relate to this. I will sometimes rush through that part of my morning. I might just make myself some toast. I, personally, can fall into a really simple habit of, I'll just make toast every day, I'll just do, you know, I'll just do something simple like that every day. When I think about it, I realize, where are my nutrients? Is that setting me up for nutrients that are going to give me energy throughout the day? Because for me, I really notice, I made a joke about this a year ago, but I said, I want to be as energetic. And when I say energetic, I was, I can't even, like, I can't even describe how, like, hyper I used to be. And I said, I want to be like that without caffeine. I realized how so much I was almost covering up so much with caffeine that I didn't realize my energy might have been low because I wasn't getting enough nutrients or this or that. So yeah, take that for what it is. All in all, just figure out what works for you. It's a process of trial and error, exploration. If you don't know where to start, I would 10 out of 10 recommend Good Mornings by Linnea Dunn. Again, it's linked in the show notes. It's straightforward, simple book, easy to read, but really impactful. She gets into some of the science of each of these, you know, different practices that we can put in our ritual, how and why to do them, from yoga and meditation to workouts, clearing the mind, gut health, cleansing, connecting to nature, acceptance, and trusting and flowing throughout our day. It's a really great read. Like I said, 10 out of 10. If you need that sort of inspiration, look for it. Write a list of activities that feed your soul, things that light you up, things you love and enjoy doing that energize you. Whatever it might be, it could be, you know, on top of all those things I just said. For you, it might be reading. For you, it might be journaling. It could be skincare. Whatever it is, write that list of things that give you energy and feed your soul and figure out which ones you can do in the morning. Try it out. Test it out. See what works. Last but not least, how. How to create your ritual. Likely, you might find you might need to wake up earlier. Once you get a sense of how long it takes you to move through your morning comfortably without rushing, doing everything that you know, is on your list, that feeds your soul, that grounds you, that anchors you. You know about when you should rise, and from there you can determine about when you should go to sleep. When we wake up earlier and we give ourselves the space to be present for everything rather than rushing through it, this helps us be more present throughout the day. It sets us up and anchors us in presence to move consciously and intentionally and as slow as we want. We might need to go to bed earlier. We might need to look at even what we're doing in our evening, which, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we'll be talking about in an upcoming episode on evening rituals. And stack these practices on top of your normal routine and replace what you no longer want to. So if you wake up and immediately check your phone and you want to stop doing that, you have the open space to check in with yourself. You could read something, you can meditate, you can say affirmations. When we get aware of how we're spending our time, we realize how we can use that time to feed our souls, to energize us, to anchor us. If you want to learn more about stacking, habit stacking, and, you know, habits there's a great book, I've referenced it before on here, I'm pretty sure, called Atomic Habits. 
That will also be linked in the show notes. A great read that could be really helpful if you really feel like you're struggling with habits. If you always make tea or coffee in the morning, right after or before that, you can choose to journal, you can choose to read, you can choose to meditate as an example of of habit stacking and creating that routine and ritual. It's a bit of trial and error, but just figure out what are the really impactful things and what what works for me and what do I want to hit each morning. Identify why you want to do these things. So I kind of explained to you my why for each of those things that I do. And so when you write your list of those things that nurture your soul, energize you, write why next to each. How will you and your day benefit from doing this? Because again, that's that helps anchor in meaning that is so important in rituals. For me, every few months as I see it's time for a change or I need to recenter my morning routine because I've fallen off certain practices and it might be every few weeks, it really depends, I will rewrite what I want to do in those times. You know, I'll make a list of the things I want to hit. Boom. Done. Anchored. Finally, I want to highlight this last point because I think it's so powerful and I think it's such a great antidote to I don't have time. First, there's a great quote that says, instead of saying I don't have time, Try saying it's not a priority and see how that feels. That's already pretty powerful. As I was talking to one of our beta testers the other day, she said how she adapted part of one of our lessons in the workshop they're testing in its reverse, which was the 5 by 5 rule. The 5 by 5 rule is essentially that if it's not going to matter in five years, don't give it more than five minutes of your time. So in the reversal, not only will these practices in your morning ritual pay off now, but they'll add up to pay off in, say, five years, then we should give it at least five minutes of our time. What is five minutes of our time for how it will benefit us? And five minutes is five minutes. We can all find five minutes. And I love that. I think that makes it so simple. It breaks it down into such an easy and small increment of time and step. Because it's not about spending 30, 40 minutes, an hour on something. We can build up to it. We can work up to a longer practice if we feel we're needing that. But sometimes we only have five minutes. Sometimes we wake up and now. We have a little less time and space in the morning, but we're still going to hit all of those little points, all those necessities. We don't compromise on what we do, but we can compromise on how much time we spend on it. And by time, I mean how much meaningful, conscious attention. I hope this has inspired you to go create your morning ritual. Consider what you're doing in the morning and how you can change it up, what you might need, what might be missing, what's not working. Have fun with it. It's a really, it can, it's a really fun, I love, (laughs) I'm, (laughs) I can't be the only one. I love the promise of creating my morning ritual. I love the promise of revising it because I know how impactful it is and I get so excited to wake up the next morning and do my little things in the morning and it's awesome have fun with it enjoy it yeah that's it for us i hope you enjoyed this conversation share with a friend you can follow yourself on instagram tumblr pinterest whatever floats your boat our beta test is closed we are no longer accepting participants we have gotten an overwhelming number of applications and I'm so grateful to every last person that applied and expressed interest. Thank you. Until next week, have a great week. Bye everybody.